quick, but um, it is our great pleasure today to have uh, the administrator of USDA National Ag Statistics Service, uh, Hubert Hamer, and uh, to have uh, the head of remote sensing for NAS, uh, Rick Mueller, with us to present and give a little background about uh, the National Ag Statistics Service. Uh, it was my great pleasure to get to work with uh, both of these gentlemen uh, when I was at USDA and learn about the amazing work that uh, USDA NAS is, is doing. And I thought it was directly relevant to not only the phenomics community, and this is part of the Plant Phenome Journal webinar, uh, but our parent societies, the Crop Science Society, American uh, Society of Agronomy, and the uh, Soil Science Society of America. So all of them have been, been invited as well. Uh, I'm going to try and deal with any Zoom issues that are going on throughout the, the talk, um, but otherwise I will pass the uh, mic over to uh, Mr. Hamer to uh, give us an overview of NAS, and then I think uh, Dr. Mueller will follow up with some coverage of remote sensing. So take it away. Thank you, Dr. Murray. I appreciate the opportunity to be with you here today uh, to uh, show a little bit about NAS and what we do and how we do things. Again, I want to also indicate that we have Wilbur Hundle on board. He, uh, on the call, he's our Southern Plains Regional Director located in Austin, Texas. Uh, so we're glad to have him here. He's our eyes and ears on the ground out there and also our chief recruiter uh, for the Southern Plains area. So we're glad to have him on uh, along with Rick Mueller. So I'll go ahead and jump into a couple, couple of the slides uh, and talk a little bit about NAS as an agency. Uh, we are the data collection arm for USDA. Our mission is to provide the timely, accurate, and useful information that I hope you're making use of. Uh, we've been in business uh, for quite a while uh, providing this service. Uh, let me move to uh, the next slide. Just a little bit of background, a little bit of history on us. Uh, obviously, I wanted to highlight two former presidents. Uh, President um, Washington, uh, he was the first statistician. Uh, he actually surveyed some of the uh, local states to get information on land values, prices, and yield. And obviously, we're very partial to President Lincoln uh, for his vision uh, to establish the Department of Agriculture in 1862 and for the purpose of information gathering. So the very thing that we exist for, he established the department for uh, in 1862. You'll notice that our first crop production report was released the following year in July of 1863. Uh, this next graphic highlights the NAS field footprint. Uh, basically, uh, we're aligned uh, with 12 regional offices and 33 satellite offices across the United States. Our headquarters is here in Washington, D.C. We have roughly about 55% of our staff out in the field locations and 45% located in Washington, D.C. You'll notice that there are 12 stars around the United States. If you look at Austin, Texas, for the Southern Plains region, that's where our local uh, regional office is located that encompasses Texas and Oklahoma. Also part of our infrastructure, there are five yellow dots on this map. Basically, those are our five data collection call centers where we have enumerators called uh, farmers and ranchers directly to uh, collect information. Those are located in Montana, Wyoming, St. Louis, Oklahoma and Arkansas. NAS is one of the smaller agencies in US uh, DA. We have about really about 850 full-time federal employees. Well, how do we get all this work done with 850 federal employees? Uh, in addition to that, we have 3,000 contract employees that are part of our organization. About 2,400 of those uh, enumerators are located scattered within the United States all over, uh, basically in most counties. They'll knock on the doors of significant producers out there to collect information directly from those farmers and ranchers. I talked about the five data collection centers. We have about 600 enumerators that work in those call centers, and they collect roughly about two thirds of our information by phone. We collect uh, information on the web, uh, we collect information by mail, uh, and then uh, the primary uh, mode of collection is by uh, telephone. 
Next graphic, I want to talk a little bit about our core values at NAS, some of the things that are very important to us. Number one, policy relevance. Uh, we want to make sure the information that we collect is useful to the people that write our checks, uh, the Congress. Uh, they use, obviously, a lot of this information as an example for the Farm Bill or other types of activities. Uh, we want to make sure that we have objectivity in our process, that we maintain the credibility with our data user community. If you're disseminating products and the data users are not valuing those products, uh, that's when you know your services are no longer needed. We must maintain the trust also of our data providers, the farmers and ranchers, the core information that we use. We use not only farmer reported information, but on our crop surveys, we use objective measure information where we go out directly into the fields and collect information uh, with trained enumerators. They harvest samples, make plant and uh, calculations, or, et cetera. And also, we want to make sure that we maintain uh, that we have a strong commitment uh, to customer service. We're here to provide the statistical information uh, that data users depend on uh, for decision making, uh, et cetera. Okay, I want to talk a little bit about what we do and, and how we do some of that. Uh, we collect and assimilate and uh, process information. We uh, disseminate about 450 to 500 statistical reports on an annual basis. The graphic on the right is our 2020 Agricultural Statistics Board calendar. It has all of the reports, the time and date of when those reports will be released. Uh, to be part of the statistical community, to be a federal statistical agency, one of the things you have to do is publish uh, your schedule uh, about a year in advance, such that the public will know exactly when to anticipate the date and the time that that information will be delivered. In addition to that agricultural estimates program, we also conduct the Census of Agriculture. That program is conducted every five years. I'll speak a little bit more about that in a few minutes. The last census data were available for the 2017 crop season. We work very closely with a number of our partners and affiliates out there. Uh, we work closely with the NASDA, the State Departments of Agriculture, all of the commissioners, secretaries, and directors of agriculture. We have memorandums of understanding with most uh, land grant colleges and universities. And we also conduct uh, statistical re research, not only in house, uh, but for some other clients around USDA and agriculture. Talk a little bit about some of the things that we don't do. Uh, we try to stay in our own lane. We don't set any policy within the agency nor do we regulate any activity. We're non-regulatory activity. Uh, a lot of our information may be used for those purposes, but internally, we don't regulate any activity. Nor do we permit any influence uh, on our statistical and processes. All of the employees that work for USDA NAS, they are career civil servants, no political appointees in the agency. So when you see a statistical product from us, you don't have to worry about the secretary or staff members from the Secretary of Agriculture trying to unduly influence those reports. Uh, we don't disclose the identity of any of our respondents or any of their information. In fact, information provided to NAS by farmers and ranchers is protected by law, Title VII of the U.S. Code, also, the recently assigned Evidence-Based Policy Act. Before that, the legislation was called CIPSIA, Confidential Information Protection and Statistical Efficiency Act, to again protect the confidentiality of the information provided uh, by farmers and ranchers. There are significant fines, five years uh, in prison, uh, up to $100,000 in fines if you uh, do something uh, that would disclose, intentionally disclose individual uh, producer information. This graphic talks about uh, some of the people that we serve, obviously the farmers and ranchers. Uh, we serve the producers. They use our information in their decision-making process. Again, they are the benchmark, uh, the, some of the most important information that we 
that we use in our uh, estimating program. We also use administrative data from agencies like the Farm Service Agency. We use satellite information, remote sensing data. You'll hear more about that from uh, Rick Mueller in a few minutes, but we've used satellite data in the organization, I know at least from the 1970s, so it's not something new to us. Uh, the technology has improved over time, and you'll get a chance to take a look at uh, how we're using that. Obviously, the data user community is very important to us. Uh, we want to make sure that the data are available uh, for decision making, and that, uh, again, along with the farmers and ranchers, we have a lot of users within the Department of Agriculture uh, to administer the, administer the farm uh, bill programs. Uh, the uh, FSA Farm Service Agency uses our information. The Risk Management Agency uses our information for uh, to develop risk management tools and products. Uh, the, the data are also used when you have a natural disaster. You've had hurricanes come through Texas. You have droughts every year, floods every year somewhere in Texas. Those data are used to help support and administer uh, these programs. Uh, again, producers especially uh, can use data to help determine yield and productivity. Uh, uh, you know, bankers, uh, some other traders use the information to track trends, uh, to set prices, uh, to negotiate cash rent contracts. So there are a lot of different ways our information is being used. Uh, some users go directly to our website. They collect the information, use it. We never really see some of the purposes uh, that they're using the data for. Uh, but uh, we have, uh, again, a lot of different data users out there. And uh, we hear about uh, things that they're not happy about in our program, if they're looking for changes to be made. Uh, if, for instance, if we have budget cuts and we have to reduce the scope of our program, uh, I get lots of communication uh, when that happens. In addition to coming to see me or writing, uh, we'll send them to the Department of Ag, to the secretary, uh, so that they can hear the concerns. And ultimately, they end up uh, possibly talking to congressional representation as uh, we receive our uh, appropriations directly uh, uh, from the Congress. Uh, again, when you, when you talk about our data and using, uh, having fact-based decisions, all of that's fine and good if it translates into profitability. Uh, so we are interested in seeing how uh, some of the uh, users use our information, uh, some of the decision-making uh, processes that they go through, but it's all about when you're dealing with the producer, trying to make sure that they have information to make smarter decisions to improve their profitability. I want to uh, change gears a little bit and just talk a little bit about the uh, Census of Agriculture program. Uh, the Census program has been in place since 1840. Uh, the Census was always conducted by the U.S. Census Bureau until it moved over to USDA in 1997. So we've co uh, conducted the uh, five-year census program, the last five censuses at USDA NAS. The most recent version of the census was released on April 11, 2019. That was for the 2017 data. The beauty of the census program is the Census of Agriculture is designed to measure the structure of U.S. agriculture, to look at, look at it over time, to see what significant changes are taking place. It measures the, the amount of land uh, in U.S. agriculture, the number of farms, uh, the number of farmers, the demographic characteristics of these farmers. Uh, it uh, me uh, measures the value of production uh, in U.S. agriculture. So there's a lot of information we have information for more than 3,000 counties, parishes, and boroughs across the United States. It's the most comprehensive uniform data for and about U.S. agriculture. And uh, we're already working on the next uh, uh, version that will be uh, conducted for the year 2020, uh, 2022. Uh, and this graphic really highlights our response rate uh, for the last census. We had nearly 72 percent uh, that responded and uh, higher response rates uh, 
in the north in, in the northern uh, Midwest, uh, some of the western states, and then a little bit uh, a lower response in the southeastern area. So the Census of Ag program is our largest program, very important. Again, providing information uh, that release on uh, Sept on uh, April 11th had 6.7 million new data points on agriculture uh, for 2017. And by the end of the calendar year, we had re uh, reduced also the census of aquaculture and the uh, irrigation and water management study. So that was up to about 10 million new data points uh, talking about and measuring uh, the bounty of US agriculture. I mentioned that we're one of the smaller agencies. I talk about marketing matters. We build partnerships. We work with other organizations. We utilize uh, the uh, USDA uh, county-based uh, structure out there. If we want to uh, publicize the census or publicize some of our surveys, uh, we're really pushing um, uh, internet re re reporting. Uh, we've seen uh, through the uh, pandemic a large increase uh, in participation online. Uh, we've had some uh, publicity campaigns trying to get the word out to make sure that producers go online and provide the information. Uh, we've also seen our mail response in increase quite a bit. So those are encouraging signs. Again, it shows that time and times like this, uh, you really need uh, information uh, to make decisions and uh, we wanna be able to measure the impact of this uh, pandemic on US agriculture. Okay, again, uh, when you take a look, uh, we're talking about the farmers and ranchers being the primary source of information. We wanna make sure that we have the information they need uh, to make their decisions. I wanna to talk to you something that's about something that's very unique. Uh, at USDA, we have a process that's called lockup. Well, what is lockup? I think Dr. Murray had a chance to participate uh, before he left USDA. It's basically a space where it's a full physical uh, perimeter around the workspace uh, for the purpose of releasing very sensitive market moving information. And uh, this lockup occurs generally once a month. Uh, some month we might have two depending on the, uh, the time of the season where we have our analysts, statisticians and the like, they go in their screening process is very similar to going through an airport uh, where you want to make sure that there are no transmittal devices, in, uh, devices inside lockup, uh, no internet connectivity, basically no contact with the outside world. Uh, some of the months they'll go in at midnight, uh, especially in August, that's our largest uh, month for the lockup uh, process because we have more commodities being estimated. Uh, so we'll have uh, statisticians, uh, the uh, uh, security staff will show up about an hour before the statisticians and analysts come into this process. The only thing they're allowed to bring, they can bring food or drink, whatever they'll need to get them through noon of the next day, that's when the report is actually released. Well, why do we have a process called lockup? Uh, we had a breach uh, around 1905 where Cotton, uh, it's still imported in Texas. It was our most important commodity at the time. And the analyst was working with a merchandiser, a trader on the outside, and they were able to get information outside um, uh, to that trader. Uh, so we put a process in place that basically locks down the work area and uh, those market moving reports are traded on the Chicago Mercantile Exchange or other active uh, markets. Uh, the survey process, uh, basically uh, the process around Ag, the Ag Statistics Board, uh, Washington DC headquarters basically drives the uh, requirements, the parameters, pr pr uh, produces the edit and summary. The regional offices, uh, they're pretty much the data collection and the initial editing and analysis phase of the data then those data are transferred into headquarters where we have a national review uh, and, and go through the lockup and dissemination uh, process to get the information out. Uh, why do we have that process? Again, to make sure we avoid errors, to ensure a consistent review, uh, to be able to evaluate from a national perspective. Our surveys are designed such that 
our uh, estimates are more precise at the U.S. level than the regional level down to the state and county level. So we want to make sure we have that top level review as part of that process. And obviously to secure the process, if traders are able to get that information before the markets open, they're able to make a take a position in the market. And it's amazing how well you can do if you already know uh, the result of those survey activity uh, before the markets open. Some of the uh, commodities that we look at inside lockup, corn yield forecast, the soybean yield, cotton forecast, uh, wheat, uh, citrus uh, production, primarily oranges from Florida, uh, grain stocks. Uh, the secretary and, the, and on the livestock side, we also have cattle and hogs as part of the lockup process. The secretary of agriculture or his designate comes over about 15 minutes before the report is being released. He'll sign the report without knowing the content of the report, and then he will be given a briefing. The secretary is in the room until well past noon. The report has been disseminated on, through the internet and is out and actively trading. Another unique uh, part of lockup, the secretary is not allowed to make a public statement about the content of the report until one at least one hour after the report has been released to allow the markets to be able to move effectively if the secretary says something it could affect the trading of commodities so uh that's in place to make sure that he doesn't make a public statement uh, before uh 1 p.m eastern standard time the reports are released at 12 noon uh, so I'm going to put an invitation out, uh, Dr. Murray, if you are, some of your staff members are back in, in the D.C. area when we go through the lockup. Uh, once we get through the pandemic, uh, we will again entertain visitors. Uh, and they'll be able to come in uh, to lockup and be a witness to the process. So wanted to kind of give you a little bit of background on the agency, where we're located at, our staff resources. Uh, one thing I have, since I have Will Hundle online, again, our three primary areas that we recruit are agricultural statisticians, mathematical statisticians, and information technology specialists. We also have a variety of other jobs in the agency, a public affairs staff, they do marketing, we have an international programs arm, so we have a lot of different options. If you come into the organization, you're able to freely move around, uh, and to make sure you get the right career uh, options uh, within the agency. So uh, Seth, uh, that's kind of what I wanted to, to talk about. And I don't know how you want to handle it if you want me to uh, release this, pro this uh, slide or are you able to move to Rick or how do you want to handle that? I think you're going to have to handle this first of all. Thank you. Let me mute you. Thank you, first of all, uh, Mr. Hamer. That was a great uh, overview of what NAS does, and that's exactly what I was hoping you were going to show. Um, so we can either do a couple questions. I don't know if the chat is going to work for questions. I, I did lock that down. Um, or if you want to move to uh, Rick, and if you're going to stick around for um, his presentation, but if you got to go, maybe we should take questions from you first. Your call, I may have to hop off. So uh, if we could take a, if you have a couple, I'll take them. It can be on any, any of our operational programs or the census, I would defer the um, uh, remote sensing questions to Rick. So I'd appreciate if anybody has a question, if they could try and chat uh, with me. I think, I think you can send me a chat and I'd be happy to read it off. Um, but I, I'm glad you put in a plug for uh, the uh, working conditions or to, you know, for the, the job opportunities at NAS. Um, what is, what do you guys feel like NAS is like to work at for somebody coming out of school right now what what how do i say that again say the question one more time so how what what would nas be like to work with uh coming out of school because most people are familiar with academia or, or uh, industry jobs what how would a nas position be different well what we prefer we really like uh entrance uh, uh the, the initial uh job opportunity to, to be in one of our 12 regional offices where you can really get some on the ground experience to be able to be work inside the office, 
be able to get out and work with some of the commodity organizations and, and just kind of get a firm understanding of how what's it like to uh, go through the data collection process? What's it like to run surveys, to collect information, do the analysis, uh, edit uh, questionnaires, and then be able to edit information? So that'll give you a firm understanding. We'd prefer you to have a firm understanding of our basic processes and procedures, uh, how we go about our business, it, preferably to have that uh, background before you move into Washington, D.C., Washington, D.C., where you would be a national program director. It's, uh, again, very helpful to have the, uh, the basic understanding that you get at the, uh, in the uh, regional field offices. Okay, thanks. I unlocked the, locked the chat. It seems like uh, people weren't able to, to ask questions. So um, go ahead if you got a question and send it to me um, to, to chat and I'll be happy to read out loud. Um, I think one of the other things that's very relevant to this audience is that you have companies who are also trying to put out similar estimates to NAS from remote sensing. Um, how do you think, you know, how do you, what, what's your picture on why NAS, um, I know I have my opinions, the unbiased and, uh, you know, the, the transparent process NAS goes through, but um, you'll hear people argue that maybe we should just rely on private sector estimates. Um, what, what would you say to those, those people? I would say the private sector uh, numbers are out there. You have to pay for those numbers. Uh, obviously, you talked about transparency. Uh, we're the only uh, organization that provides something out there that levels the playing field for everyone involved. And in fact, we do track uh, some of the private forecasts. Uh, uh, those are part of uh, the uh, secretary's briefing slides. You'll see how uh, those uh, private analysts stack up against the USDA numbers. And I'm gonna tell you from year to year, they can be all over the board. There's no accountability in the process. And again, we don't have a financial uh, dog in the fight, all right? All of our employees are career civil servants. They're not able to trade commodities. Uh, and uh, so you're gonna get the best information available. Uh, we, uh, our surveys, we typically run 70, 75 percent response rate on our yield surveys, we have a great relationship with the farmer and rancher community. And again, we use that information. We're able to use administrative data. We're able to use satellite information. We have more information as part of our forecast estimates uh, than anyone else. Yeah, and as, as I recall, <laughs> As I recall, some of the private companies are using NAS data to train their models. So that's uh, that's a that that says they're the gold standard. Oh, somehow I can't unmute you here. Um, we do have a question from Justin McGrath. Uh, he says uh, you said that some users go directly to the website, which implies that there's another way to access the data. Uh, could you describe other ways? And I'm not able to unmute you, uh, Mr. Hamer, so. There you go. Okay, can you hear me now? Yep. Okay, uh, well, we, we have a quick stats database uh, that we, uh, uh, obviously all of our data goes directly into it. We also have paper products. Uh, you're able to, to, to get paper products. You can go to our website uh, directly and go to what's called a today's link. Uh, to get information for the reports that are coming out today. And then we have a repository uh, at Cornell University where they store all of our uh, data uh, on uh, their website also. Uh, so there are a number of different ways. And if you, uh, we also do uh, uh, AP, um, API uh, if you want to have information, uh, 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 have received information that way as well. Okay, great. Well, thank you. Uh, I don't see any other questions in the chat, so I'm going to suggest we move over to uh, Dr. Mueller. Um, so uh, I think you'll probably have to stop sharing your screen so uh, he can take over. Can you see it, Rick? Is Rick muted? I'm oh. working on it. There we go. The 
depending on how you're set up. There you go. So we're seeing the slide deck right now. So if you can put it in presentation mode. And while you're doing that, I'll just say that I was blown away when I was at uh, USDA to learn um, how um, the other monitor, because uh, right now we're seeing your presenter view. Yeah, perfect. Um, I was just blown away at all the things you guys are doing with remote sensing. So I think the, the community would be very interested in this as well. So uh, please take it away. Yeah, just one second. It's doing the presenter view or the... Nope, it's not in the presenter view. We're seeing your slide. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Hubert, for the, for the leading and the, and the, the stuff here. Uh, so my name is Rick Mueller. I'm the head of the spatial analysis research section, and we're using uh, remote sensing for a wide variety of applications. And we're going to dive into that uh, as, as, as we go on here. So this is our main geospatial data product, and this is the forms the basis for all of our, mainly all of our other geospatial programs. So this program is called the cropland data layer. Uh, we use this to, me to, to measure and estimate crop acreage independently from the survey process. We'll monitor crops throughout the growing season. So we're, we're going to look at uh, beginning in April, and then we're going to run through till winter, early, uh, late fall. We, we do our analysis at 30 meters and 30 meters only at this point. We do our analysis at a national scale or scope. And we've been doing nationally on an annual basis for over, you know, this is our 12th year. We're working on our 13th year now. And at the end of the season, when the markets have settled, we release this data product to the public. Basically, we're mapping over 100 crop categories. I think it, the number is like 113. Uh, this year, we added triticale. Uh, it was a corn triticale was a, 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 a dual crop. And the previous year, we in 2018, we added um, avocados. So as we're finding new data, we're able to map it and successfully put it into the, pro in the program. Uh, how do we do this? We do this through uh, machine learning decision tree algorithms, because we have uh, ground data and we're using um, you know, supervised classifications to perform this. And we're capturing you know, all major commodities across the U.S., corn, rice, cotton, beans, wheat, and all the major speculative crops that NAS makes estimates on, as well as grapes, um, citrus industry, and uh, there's a wide variety of crops that we're mapping. So here's the major inputs that we're doing with the cropland data layer, or as we say internally, the CDL. So we're using... Uh, data from the, da the DMC, otherwise known as the Disaster Monitoring Constellation. It's the Deimos 1 and UK 2. Now this past, uh, we used this up until 2019. Uh, this year, the UK 2 was decommissioned and we're using some new satellites uh, as a replacement. But we're also using ResourceSat 2, and that's run by the Indian Space Research Organization. We're using Sentinel 2, A and B, now these particular sensors are run by the European Union's Copernicus uh, outfit. And again, running Landsat 8, medium resolution, 30 meters. And this was um, launched in 2013. And they're getting ready for another launch in a year or so for the Landsat 9 program. Uh, on the bottom left corner here, we're seeing the Farm Service Agency Common Land Unit. That provides us the agricultural training data for uh, allows us the ability to do our supervised land cover. Now, we do our land cover processing using a, a combination of ERDAS Imagine, and then we use this thing in between uh, called the, the NLCD Toolkit, and we also use C5, spelled S-E-E, -E, and then the number five. So using the combination of ERDAS, C5, and the Toolkit, we're able to do our supervised classification using a wide variety of satellites. Um, like I said, here we've got six showing. And then the upper right corner, we have this supplemental ground reference data set. And we're seeing a, a, on odd, you know, on opposite ends of, of, of the country where we have collected extra data sets that 
are not being reported by to the Farm Service Agency. For instance, bottom right, or the, the, in Florida here, we have extra data provided from the Florida Department of Citrus. And then in California, we have extra information provided to us from uh, uh, it's, uh, it's like almond data over that industry. And then Southern California and uh, Arizona, Nevada, we have extra data from uh, the, the Bureau of Reclamation. And then Washington Department of Ag gives us uh, some of their industry data that they've collected. But another very important um, additional product and process that we put into our data stream here is the 2016, that's the most recent, National Land Cover Data Set, or the NLCD. This is a land cover set that, that they don't do ag-specific data collection, uh, classifications, but they, they provide information on the non-agricultural components, the, the rangeland, the forest, uh, and they, they give tree types, deciduous, conif coniferous, and mixed forest, and they also do uh, urban or impervious areas. So we're using elevation as well. So there's a variety of different data sets that we're putting in here to give us the best possible agricultural specific land cover. And again, from the Farm Service Agency Common Land Unit, you know, the growers are going in and they're signing up, um, telling the government what the growers are growing. And then in return, they're getting subsidies and, and getting access to insurance programs. So it's of their benefit to you know, provide truthful information that we can run in. And, and again, as, as Hubert mentioned, you know, we maintain a, this confidential relationship with Farm Service Agency and with the growers, and we do not release this, this level of data. We release the finalized cropland data layer product. So here's a, 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 a very high level workflow of where we're building our, our, we have our inputs from the imagery and from our ground data we're also producing as the primary reason for the cropland data layer program is we make acreage estimates, which then feed into the ag statistics board, which again, Hubert was mentioning the lockup process. So this is all going into the, the actual data flow of the organization. But as a derivative of the cropland data layer product, these are the other things that we're producing. And I'm gonna to speak to most of these in the next few slides. So we have derivative products called the confidence layer, the cultivated, the crop frequency layer. We also do yield modeling using, we're identifying where the corn and soybeans are being grown in a given year to focus the attention of the classifiers and the decisions, uh, the, the, the software applications to know where these are. We're also using this to help us identify disasters and where the, where the um, you know, help us uh, know where impacted, uh, floods or fires have, have impacted our, um, our agricultural infrastructure. We also use this for area sampling frame uh, to help with the inputs and improvement of, of our sampling frames as they are. And then we're using the June area survey imputation process. So that's when we have areas of, of we can't get to a uh, facility or fields or we're being refused to go to some place we can look at the historical record of what was planted on the property or in that tract of land for the last few years to determine uh, what, what was planted and, ma and make inferences on what's gonna be uh, planted in the, in the near future. Then we also have land in farms and soil moisture, and I'll be covering that in a little bit. But we also provide this to the public through our CropScape portal and the NRCS, that's a Nas National Resource Conservation Service, uh, the geospatial data gateway. Uh, they have a very nice site and it uh, facilitates the dissemination of our data as well. And this is again, just the cropland data layer. And then the NAS website, you can come into our website, read a little bit about it, get all of our metadata from us and then download the national mosaics. So to try to get into what uh, CropScape and their portal here, what does it disseminate? So our URL is in the bottom right there, but you're seeing a national picture, and this is all of our inventory of geospatial data products. All 12 national years are sitting in here for people to uh, visualize, uh, interrogate, query, do all kinds of uh, uh, fantastic functionality, and then even using web mapping services to be able to 
pull some of this data out. And again, it's freely available to the public. We usually release this the first week of February uh, of the following year. So the 2019 product was released in um, early February uh, of this, this a few months ago. To get to, to zoom up a little bit, looking at uh, on the left side of the screen is the Pocahontas County, Iowa crop cropland classification. The yellow commodities you're seeing there is corn and green is soybeans. In Pocahontas County, there is a large production area and there's, as you can see, there's not much other uh, activities going on. There's a little bit of a few towns in there, a few uh, watersheds, but basically it's wall-to-wall -wall ag. And again, you can get 30 meter crop specific identification uh, done at this level. Now going back to the derivative products, this is the confidence layer on the far left. It's showing you, uh, it, it's, we, we put this out to the public as well. It's a value from zero to 100. And this tells how, how challenging it was for the classifier to make, uh, identify each pixel. Now the very bright white areas are areas of very high confidence. So the classifier had a, a pretty easy time identifying this. And people can use this to uh, toggle along, the, toggle off how well the first study area is. If we really struggled with it, you're gonna see that struggle if you look into it. Or you can see how well it did. And you can see in, in the Southeastern area, some of the forested areas, we, well, it's a little challenging because that's the darker color. There's less, less uh, confidence in that particular pixel. So in the center, we have the cultivated layer. Uh, it, and it's based on uh, the last five years of agricultural production. And in order for it to be identified as, so this is a very good land cover mask for ag only. And what, what this is, is if a crop has been planted two out of the five, two or more out of the five years, or the most recent year it's been planted to a, a, a tilled commodity, then it's considered cultivated and it'll be put in through uh, identified as agricultural. Now, it does not map, uh, it, it does not include hay pasture or pasture hayland. So that's one of the things when people will come at us, they ask us, well, what about the grasslands? Well, right now we, we haven't figured out a, a very highly accurate way of mapping the grasslands in this country. And that's something in the future we hope to improve upon. Then on the right side is the frequency layer. And that's basically running the entire 12 year inventory from 2008 to 2019. And we're mapping this for four specific commodities. We had a recent uh, request to do this for sugarcane and uh, it was only covers a few states at this time, we're not able to do additional commodities, but these are the most uh, frequently requested commodities. And, and what did this show? Each of these pixels, and there's a, the legend is very tiny, but the, the the darker, the the blue, or the hue, as you get into the, close to purple, that's showing continuous planting of the same crop. And this particular graphic is corn. So when you're seeing uh, the reds, maroons, purples, they're going basically end to end continuous corn production. That's what this um, the frequency layer will show. So then we also do um, yield modeling with remote sensing. The idea is you're looking at the sensitivity between you know, greenness. And this is, is actually using uh, MODIS imagery from the uh, NASA satellite. So they're looking at greenness, greenness, sorry, um, and biomass. And we're also looking at you know, the NDVI as well as the land surface temperature. That's the temperature all on the surface of, of, of the earth. And there's a negative correlation as you could expect. The hotter things are, during the summer, and if there's not adequate soil moisture, you're going to have um, uh, crop stress or reduced yield. So basically, we're looking at a uh, time series modus going across the growing season. One of the things to think about is, as you look at this uh, bell curve here, when NASA is making their first prediction on crop yield, that, that shows up in August here, in the middle of the, uh, the, the, the curve. And that makes it very challenging early in the season because each one of these uh, individual color, I mean, the, the gray is the range of the different uh, NDVI frequencies here, our uh, responses. 
and in August, it's not necessarily determined how well or how you know strong the yield is going to be. So we have to make predictions on how the curve is going to play out. So we're building an empirically based uh, prediction model, and it's looking at you know historical county level estimates from mass, and then we're integrating across the season, and we're looking at in theory the, the previously identified cropland data layer corn pixels or soybean pixels. We're also researching wheat, cotton, and rice as, as well as that. Now, this is kind of a, a disturbing slide. It's, it's, it's kind of, it's, it's very sad that these are all of the 2019 billion dollar weather climate disasters. Oh, there was 14 of them last year that were of major um, significant uh, cost for the, for the people and, uh, and, and the governments that, that are covering the cost. So we have developed uh, using SAR imagery, that's synthetic aperture radar. Again, this is from the European Union's Copernicus Sentinel-1 uh, satellite. Uh, actually two, there's a uh, Sentinel-1A and there's Sentinel-1B. And we're also using the cropland data layer and then we're also producing a disaster layer. So we see up on the first uh, upper left corner here, we have uh, Missouri and Illinois flooding. And that was in early uh, 2019. That was very persistent and large scale. Then there was Tropical Storm Barry. Then there was um, Dorian that struck the East Coast, uh, Central Atlantic area. And then at the end of the year was the, in November was the Kincaid fire in Sonoma County that impacted the grapes. And you can see the grape infrastructure here was just, some of that area has got singed and burned and disastered uh, at, during that time uh, when that fire extent happened. So we're looking at cultivated crops, we're looking at livestock and how that's being impacted and using um, new approaches with uh, sad, uh, synthetic aperture radar that we had not had up until uh, year 2015 when the Sentinels were launched. We also use the, uh, the cropland data layer to influence how the area frame is constructed, uh, looking at where the, how intense the areas are cultivated. So the area frame is helping us estimate, you know, the, the major commodities. It also helps the, the area frame measure incompleteness of the list frame for censuses and surveys. And you remember Hubert was talking about our response rates in the uh, in the 71, 72 percentile for the census. And it also serves as ground reference for remote sensing estimates. And it's also very good for helping us identify areas where we have to do follow on surveys in case of when there's a special uh, need or uh, the disaster response type of survey. We're also working on a soil moisture prototype. Uh, we came up with a name and it's not yet public but it's being called the crop chasma, crop condition and soil moisture analytics. So this is derived from both um, the NASA SMAP mission, SMAP stands for uh, soil moisture active passive. And then there's the MODIS mission, which is the moderate um, image uh, vegetative condition system. So we're looking at releasing this in the, in the next few weeks and this combines vegetative condition and soil, topsoil and root zone level uh, moisture analytics. So we've got a color chart there and you can see, you know, from the looks of that, it was in that particular picture on the East Coast, it looks like there was a lot of standing water uh, coming down in, over, the, over this US. There's also another uh, program that uh, under our secretary and the, the chairman of the FCC, which we're working on wiring up rural broadband uh, areas. And this is this instance we're using, um, trying to determine where there are gaps in broadband or wireless coverage and leverage census data, survey data, and remote sensing data to try to, to, try to identify where the cultivated areas are and, is, and to determine where we can, um, you know, make recommendations on where um, broadband needs to be provided. What, what they're, the ultimate goal of, and I think it's a very noble one, is that, you know, it's for the big data tractors and it's for distance learning for, for students. They're trying to have 
95% of America wired for broadband by 2025. That's a very noble cause, and the USDA and FCC are working very hard at this. Uh, 2019 was also a very challenging year for um, planting in the, uh, the Midwest heartland area of the country. And basically, as you see on that graphic, the yellow areas were, you know, planted, and I, I shouldn't say the tan areas are the planted, and then the dark brown was the prevented areas. Of, of that was almost 20 million acres were impacted last year by, um, by impacted by the large amount of rain that rainfall that came in during planting time, but it made it very challenging for the planters to get in there. So we came up with an approach to what can we do to uh, try to develop an early season estimate uh, to identify what's been planted in these major states. So we're looking at all available data and trying to you know, determine if we can see, and we did a pilot over Illinois, can we determine when corn and soybeans uh, and how much was planted? They're gonna be updated throughout the growing season using a variety of agro-meteorological uh, variables, precipitation, temperature, soil moisture. And then we're looking at um, what areas were not being able to, were not able to be planted because of these weather phenomena that happened. So we're looking at some of the, um, the inputs here, or the, the, the CLU data, as I mentioned before, we use that for the cropland data there. We're also using this for, the, uh, for this Illinois pilot study. And we're also looking at SMAP data, GRACE data. GRACE provides us information on uh, you know, soil moisture or drought indications. Looking again, precip, crop emergence, uh, elevation, and then the planar slope of the land. And trying to determine, you know, can we make early season indications uh, estimates looking at all the cropland data layers that have been ever produced? And then looking at the reported data, such as the FSA CLU, looking at the rotation patterns, looking at the market prices, the economic piece, looking at environmental data, and then all kinds of survey administrative data, as I mentioned. And it's like, we're trying to predict, you know, the fraction of, of what's being planted within the CLU. And then looking at, you know, can we deter, can we run this right now at, at a county level? And can we run this up to a state level and then run this to a national level? Right now, we don't have high performance computing within the agency. Uh, we're looking at getting that. We, so we, uh, we're doing this in snippets on Earth Engine of all places and trying to um, come up with ways that can get us to a larger, uh, higher performance computing environment. And that's one of our challenges since we have confidential data. We don't have secret data, top secret, but we have confidential data and we do not want to have that information breached to the public. Uh, one of the new things we're trying this year is working with planet uh, imagery. So to provide us crop progress and condition data on a weekly basis. Now we're supposed to, we were supposed to start this in May. We haven't received the data yet. It's still in co under contract uh, getting finalized. But these are the nine states that are getting monitored on an ongoing basis every week up until the end of uh, October. And this is high resolution imagery, uh, anywhere from three to five meters per satellite. Now these are basically very good high end um, digital cameras like an SLR camera in space. And there's 150 of them out there. Uh, they, they're very you know, economical satellites and they, they, they have a small service life. There's no propulsion mechanism on them. So there's no onboard fuel. They just get launched out of uh, different rockets and they're in free fall and, uh, and they do their earth observations. So basically they're covering the red, green and blue uh, part of the visible spectrum. And there's one near our, near, near our band on that. So we're trying to do this to see if, can we use high res imagery of, of sorts to help us look at the conditions of crops this year. Uh, getting closer to the end here, these are some of the reported applications that we've had uh, people come to us and say, 
well, we're using the cropland data layer for this, or we want to use it for this. How useful is it? And we've made the letters or the words large based on the reported uses of that. And as other things are, are smaller, like loss of farmland, precision ag, people are using it, uh, reporting it less. But this gives you an idea of what uh, the applications are being used for. And here are some of the users, a wide variety uh, across the country. Um, and they don't necessarily explain to us what they're using for, but they will complain to us about what's wrong with our product and can we look into something that we can do to enhance that. And that's usually when we begin the ask of, okay, well, we would like additional information on this certain commodity. What can you give us to help us with the crop identification? So looking into our future, we really, really want to move to cloud-based processing. You know, we're, we're, we can continue to do the standard CDL, but we would like to move to a higher resolution. And I believe that would Im improve some of the small area uh, identification or estimation of crops. We will be able to do earlier seasons and all crops across the country. Uh, right now we're, 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 we're doing it, but it, the, the cadence is, uh, could be improved. Um, and again, looking at integrating multiple data sources, administrative data from the Farm Service Agency, survey data from NAS, and remote sensing and industry data or economic data that can help us uh, with the identification of crops uh, in an earlier basis. And then ultimately, you know, we want to stay relevant within the organization and increase our utility within, you know, the agency because we have a lot of people come at us and they want to partner with us as a, uh, as a future contributor to our data stream. And one of the caveats we always have is, well, if you sell to the public or to private worlds, uh, we can't necessarily be your partner because we have to be exclusive because the data, uh, we, we can't have subscri subscribers and we can't be a, a subscriber to your data feed as well as uh, to others. So we require exclusivity and uh, there's my contact information and I appreciate your time and, uh, and, and listening in. Thank you. Well, thank you, that was great. Um, I think that's, ex again, exactly what I was hoping you would, you would cover. Um, I, you know, we can, we can take some time for questions. I opened up the chat again, if anybody would like to ask anything. Um, it's amazing to see what you guys have jumped into in the next, uh, in the last three years since I left. And the soil moisture monitoring looks looks really important and really cool. I'm sure there's going to be a lot of users of that product. Um, I'll, I'll just ask a question while we're waiting to see if anything shows up in the chat. So, you know, I think a lot of our dream is that uh, at some point the satellite predictions would be as good or better than the lockup process, right? And that we'd be able to get those estimates earlier. Um, what do you think the timeline is till you can feel comfortable about something like that happening? Whether or not it's used is a different story, but that you feel like the estimates are as good or better than lockup. Uh, well, I think we're still a few years away. We, we finally have a, a good set of medium resolution satellites that help us, uh, that can, we can use to update the phenology throughout the growing season. That didn't, that, that was not possible four or five years ago. So we have really good data stream coming in, but we don't have the compute internally to do this. So that makes it really challenging. But I, in the next few years, I think NAS would be open to the idea of, you know, updating our estimates on a higher cadence level. But again, we've got to have proven track record. They're, they're just not going to say, okay, turn on the remote sensing number and let's feed it out there. It's got to go through and we've got to beat it up over the process and, and trying to uh, you know, make it make it right. Great. Well, we got three questions already. So um, first question uh, from Justin McGrath. I think you said this, but are these tools updated annually or are they updated in real time? Like the cropland data layer? Uh, I, I don't I don't know the answer to that. So why don't you answer whatever ways he might be asking that? Well, the, the CDL product is is released annually in February. It's usually the day after Super Bowl. So that's when I would tell people to look at look for it. So that's that's released. But how about the updates? 
when is it when is it updated for your own uses is it updated annually or updated in real time now we update the cropland data layer internally on a monthly cadence during the growing season we also update the yield model monthly during the growing season uh, that's and those we don't release that to the public because it's just not it's, it's market sensitive information uh, regarding like the, the, the new SMAP product, the crop chasma, that will be, that's updated and open to the public on a, it's going to be updated on a weekly basis. Okay. So that those are di the dif different types of products. And so the, there's different cadence to that. Yeah. I think that was very comprehensive. I think uh, that should have answered uh, his question. Um, the next question is from Juan Inesco. How do you estimate the soil moisture within the images? Okay, well, the, the SMAP mission will give us volumetric measurements from that. So it's looking at uh, like a certain band of, uh, of radar to do that. But we're also looking at ways, other than giving a volumetric reading, is to give a categorical meeting reading, like the NAS crop progress and condition report gives. So in, in our weekly crop report, we provide uh, categorical subjective readings of adequate soil moisture, surplus moisture, or deficit type. So there's like four or five uh, readings of that. So we're going to be also binning our volumetric readings into qualitative measures uh, for the public to better be able to understand uh, what's going on on a weekly basis. Cool. Uh, Masood uh, Nehban Azar is asking, have you ever compared this, the CDL or cropland data layer with the ag census data? Um, well, the one thing we always run into is we always I think Hubert mentioned you go to the Quick Stats database because that's the official source of the data. When you compare or do pixel counting on the CDL, it's never going to match the survey and it's never going to match the census. So that's one of the big major challenges. Now, if you go to, um, if you start doing your pixel counting and then you look at the confidence layer, as I mentioned earlier, that, that's one of our derivative products that's available on our NAS website you can get a determination on, okay, the CDL pixel count for corn in Illinois might be downward biased 5%. And then you look at the accuracies, they might also be 5%. So there's some uncertainty there. But you can also look at the, uh, the confidence layer to say, well, maybe we didn't have good coverage over a certain part of Illinois during that growing season and we have low confidence, and so maybe the errors are in that area. So there's ways of getting to the actual, but the, the, the NAS census and the CDL are not gonna align just because of the remote sensing and the inherent error with it. Okay, that was the last question I've listed. I'm, I'm gonna ask one more, which is, um, I'm assuming in your predictions, you're using uh, the raw data, training on the raw data that you get from producers. How much better will that end up being than using than if you were training on uh, the public release data? I assume quite a bit better, but I don't know if you have any. Well, one of the things I, I didn't mention when I was talking was we're trying to look at doing early season predictions of crops, like for the March intentions report. And if you're familiar with growing in, in the Midwest uh, in March, they're, they're barely even, or they're just starting to talk about um, uh, what's being, what's been planted or thinking about doing that. So the real challenge, it's going to be, um, can we look at uh, the, the cadence of all these different data products to do model prediction? And again, that's trying to include all data to see if we can improve upon early season because using traditional remote sensing methods, we don't know uh, what what the planted acreage is in the Midwest uh, using our current techniques. So looking at uh, multiple inputs to help us uh, improve that is, would be very beneficial. 
Well, I think that's great. I'm not seeing any other questions at the moment. So um, I guess I will extend a, a, a thank you and an outstanding job. And uh, I'll follow up with you with any other comments I've received via email or whatever, and, and your email address is there. Uh, but thank you and, and Hubert again for a great presentation. And uh, hopefully uh, this will be useful for everybody. All right. Well, thank you all. I appreciate it. Okay.